Welcome to the Archive of Nations, home of the custodians of the sacred records from time immemorial. Please subscribe and press the notification button as we have many lessons to educate and empower with a correct narrative of the past to create a lawful blueprint for the future. This webisode is entitled Miscegenation and the Mixed Multitude. Thus far in the previous three episodes in this series of the Claim of Thrones, entitled The Fallacy of Greece and Rome, we began with what is referred to as Ancient Greece founded by Pelasgus, which simply means ancient. In Webisode 4, we continue with the narrative of what occurred after the destruction of the Minoans, but before we move into the mainland of ancient Mycenae, we will explore the miscegenation between the ancient carbon organic Afarinka tribes, families, and clans, now referred to erroneously as Africans. This webisode explores some of the origins of the hybrid albino-European and their darker genetic lineage from the East Dravidian populations, their eventual spread into Nilothic Europe and the subsequent subfamilies and genetic lines that began usurping Europe and its carbon organic culture. Of all regions in Europe, Greece was closest, geographically, to the civilized world, and so the early explorers would likely have found and colonized it first. In fact, the ancient legends suggest that this is exactly what happened. It is recorded that foreigners came from across the sea in archaic times, founded cities, established kingly dynasties, and taught the ancient inhabitants of old Europe the arts of reading, writing, building, and much more. The colonists even brought new gods. One set of legends, as discussed in previous webisodes, told of Egyptian colonists who arrived with a fleet of ships and settled on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Their leader, Danaos, brought his 50 daughters with him from Egypt and made himself king of Argos. His dynasty later gave rise to such well-known heroes as Perseus and Hercules. After alluding to the Danao story in his history, Herodotus declares how it happened when Egyptians came to the Peloponnese and what they did to make themselves kings in that part of Greece has been chronicled by other writers. I will add nothing therefore, but proceed to mention some points which no one else has yet touched upon. Other legends we have covered speak of a second group of colonists who came to Greece from Phoenicia, a cluster of city-states located on what is now the Lebanese coast. The most famous of these colonists was Cadmus, the traditional founder of Thebes in central Greece. Legend held, but Cadmus was a Phoenician prince from the city of Tyre, or Sidon, in some versions. Herodotus wrote, the Phoenicians, who came with Cadmus introduced into Greece after their settlement in the country, a number of accomplishments, of which the most important was writing, and are till then, I think, unknown to the Greeks. Nor was Greece the only part of Europe touched by these legendary explorers, according to Herodotus, an Egyptian pharaoh named Sesotris once led an army up through Turkey into the Caucasus, marched westward across southern Russia, and fought his way down through Romania and Bulgaria until he reached Thrace. On the way back to Sesotris planted a colony on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. Herodotus claimed that he had seen the dark-skinned descendants of those Egyptian colonists still living in the Caucasus of the all those centuries. This was all thought to be myth just like the city of Troy, yet archaeologists have found the remains of King Priam's fabled city on the Turkish coast, destroyed by fire sometime between 1250 and 1240 BC. This and other evidence has led scholars to conclude that the Greek legends of the heroic age are in many cases based on real events, most of which can be placed during a period that archaeologists have named the Bronze Age roughly 3200 to 1200 BC. The late Maria Gimbutas, a renowned archaeologist of prehistoric times, described Bronze Age Europe as a marble cake of two cultures. The first culture she called Old European. Its people were the continent's original inhabitants. The Old Europeans, according to the Gimbatus, raised the trilithons of Stonehenge and assembled the passage graves, standing stones, dolmens, and other prehistoric stoneworks, whose massive silent and unexplained presence has long imparted to European landscapes an era of primitive mystery. Many of these people, such as the Basques of Spain and southern France, seem to have been direct descendants of the Stone Age race. All of them appear to have followed the universal Stone Age religion in that they worshipped the great goddess of the earth as their chief deity. Old Europe came to an end between 4,400 and 3,000 BC when the second culture, the so-called Kurgan people, left their homeland in South Russia and came pouring into Central and Western Europe for 2,000 years. Wave after wave of these Eastern marauders descended on the defenseless farming settlements of Old Europe. Named by Jimbatis for their characteristical burial mounds, which the Russians called Kurgani. These invaders raged across the continent, as far as Britain and Ireland, 
burning, raping, and murdering with a fiendish abandon unmatched in later centuries until the depredations of Attila the Hun. Their weapons were the bow, the spear, and the battle axe. The Kurgan people fought from horseback, a terrifying sight to the old Europeans who had never tamed the horse and possibly had never seen one. All over Europe, the archaeologist spade turns up signs of the Kurgan people's typical calling cards, such as mass graves filled with men, women, and children, their skulls pierced with axes and spears. However, they did not totally exterminate the old Europeans as isolated pockets of old Europe survived intact in parts of Greece, Spain, Italy, and Scotland and in the Mediterranean islands such as Sardinia, Crete, and Thera. In other places, Kurgan people and old Europeans coexisted and intermarried, giving rise to the admixture of tribes and cultures that Jimbatas called a marble cake. Before we explore the genetic mixing that took place in this particular region, let us begin by getting an overstanding of the racial root of these invaders that created the hybrid mulatto tribes of various genetic hues across Europe. We will begin with the Amnea, which has spawned many tribes, which are the root and origins of those hybrids who refer to themselves as Europeans in this day and time. The Yamnea culture or pit grave culture was a late Copper Age to early Bronze Age culture of the region known as the Pontic Steppe, dating to 3300 to 2600 BCE. Its name derives from its characteristic burial tradition, as these people used to bury their dead in simple pit chambers. The people of the Yamnea culture lived primarily as nomads. They are also closely connected to final Neolithic cultures, which later spread throughout Europe and Central Asia. Genetic studies have suggested that the people of the Amnea culture can be modeled as a genetic admixture between a population related to Eastern European hunter-gatherers and people related to hunter-gatherers from the Caucasus in roughly equal proportions, an ancestral component which is often named steppe ancestry, with additional admixture from carbon organic Anatolian, Levantine and early European farmers. Caucasus hunter-gatherer is an anatomically modern human genetic lineage, first identified in a 2015 study based on the population genetics of several modern Western Eurasian populations. The Caucasus hunter-gatherers managed to survive in isolation through the last glacial maximum as a distinct population. At the beginning of the Neolithic, they were probably distributed across Western Iran and the Caucasus, and people similar to Northern Caucasus and Iranian Plateau hunter-gatherers arrived before 6000 BCE in Pakistan and Northwest India. Eastern hunter-gatherers from the Pontic Caspian steppes have received admixture from Caucasus hunter-gatherers, leading to the formation of Western steppe herders, which formed the Amnea culture and expanded massively throughout Europe during the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age. People of the Amnea culture are believed to have had mostly brown eye color, light to intermediate skin, and brown hair color, with some variation. None of the Amnea samples were predicted to have either blue eyes or blonde hair. Some individuals are believed to have carried a mutation to the KITLG gene associated with blonde hair, as several individuals with steppe ancestry are later found to carry this mutation. The ancient northern Eurasian population, who contributed significant ancestry to western steppe herders, are believed to be the source of this mutation. The geneticist David Reich argues that the genetic evidence shows that Yamnea society was an oligarchy dominated by a small number of elite males. Archaeological cultures and migration studies also point to the strong presence of Yamnea descent in the current nations of South Asia, especially in groups that are referred to as Indo-Aryans. The Northwestern Indian and Pakistani populations showed significant Middle Late Bronze Age steppe ancestry. The study identified the Roars and Jats as the population in South Asia with the highest proportion of steppe ancestry. Between 3,000 and 2,000 years ago, Europe was conquered and colonized by the Yamnea tribe and their descendants. Archaeologists identify the emergence of Yamnea in Europe with a drastic and violent cultural shift. So violent, in fact, that Christian Christensen from the University of Gothenburg believes there is a case to be made placing the Yamnea as one of the most brutal and aggressive societies in history. The original carbon organic Britons who built Stonehenge were nearly all wiped out and in their place rose a warrior class of people and new customs. The Amnea originated from Eurasia and before they migrated into Europe, the carbon organic tribes, families and clans of Nilotic Europe were said to be a communal and innovative society. 6,000 years ago, huge settlements featuring enigmatic megastructures of obscure function, unique in European prehistory, and gargantuan settlements, which may have housed tens of thousands of people apiece, seem to have coalesced by the merger of smaller, independent hamlets, 
but by the year 3600 BCE, the prehistoric settlements would be run over with Yamnea peoples migrating in from the east. Starting from 3000 BC, the carbon organic genome in Europe started to change as the Yamnea fostered new generations and interbred with the original carbon organic nilotic women. The reason that this migrant society would be able to so successfully and quickly wipe out and take over Nilotic Europe with its unfamiliar environments and native carbon organic tribes has a reasonable explanation involving the spread of disease because many Neolithic Europeans congregated in mega settlements, living in close proximity to each other and livestock, disease would have easily spread. Disease and mass casualties would have resulted in these settlements being abandoned and burned down, leaving a considerably weakened population. However, a weak population alone doesn't explain the quick shift, and Christensen theorizes that young, male warriors on horseback had a considerable advantage over the carbon organic nilotic Europeans they encountered. The majority of these Yamnea were men, according to one 2017 study, and further evidence of can be found in grave sites of Yamnea men and local nilotic carbon organic women who each held their own traditional burial customs. It's believed that the Amnea killed the males of a tribe and sired future generations with local women to ensure their genetics would be passed on. With this in mind around the time of the volcanic eruptions at Thera, carbon organic civilizations were destroyed in coastal regions and beyond as a result of this chaos. The hybrid albinos, who were wandering throughout Central Asia, heard about this chaos and they began to invade Southern Europe and the Middle East after 1500 BC. Through wars attrition, the carbon organic families, tribes, and clans were conquered, but they remained a significant power until between 1000 to 500 BC when the hybrid albinos Asians in Greece began to gain a significant foothold in the area. The hybrid albinos refer to this period as the Dark Age. The art of Greece and Rome make it clear that there were carbon organics families, tribes, and clans living in this region. It was only with the invasion of these Yamnea fused tribes into the Mediterranean region that the original carbon organic families, tribes and clans were murdered or mixed in with and became replaced by mulattoes and in more recent times full hybrid albinos. The ethnology of Asia Minor was extremely mixed. No land had been exposed to invaders to such a degree as this. Let us be clear at this point that the invaders from the north are not the hybrid albinos we see in modern times referred to as white people, but more of an Indo-Asiatic stock of people of various hues from reddish brown to a caramel complexion with various hair textures due to the miscegenation that took place in the regions of Babylon and the Indus Valley region in earlier times. The mixed multitude and many other hybrid Asiatic tribes that descended from the north and mountainous regions into the Balkan, Aegean region at this time were not the well-worn cliché propagated by Western classicists and parroted by thousands of Greek school teachers around the world that the ancient Greeks were blonde and blue-eyed. The ancient tribes had no concept of racial superiority based on the color of a person's skin. That is not to say that these incoming tribes did not notice difference in color of the Afarincas of the dark reddish brown to purple slash blue black complexions which is no different than a light-skinned person discussing their darker brethren. Hesiod referring to the physiques of the dark-skinned men, and Aristotle, to those with dark skins. The key word being dark or darker than themselves. In contrast to modern Western albino hybrid conceptions of Africans as primitive and thus worthy of enslavement, domination, and colonization, the ancient Greeks seemed to have identified in African peoples a venerable lineage worthy of respect. Thus, Diodorus spoke highly of the civilized people of Mero, who lived in what is today Sudan, considering that they were the first people to worship the gods and holding Egyptian civilization to be a derivative of their own. This view is supported by some of the Homeric hymns which hold that Zeus dined with the Ethiopians, who were considered close to him. Lucian wrote that the Ethiopians were the first people to develop astrology and that they had a great reputation for wisdom. There is no underlying assumption that Africans are in any way racially inferior to anyone else, let alone the Greeks themselves. Best articulating the Greek view of cultural ascendancy, Athenian orator Isocrates, around 380 BC, in praising Athens, famously suggested that the term Greek not so much connoted a race, but rather a state of mind, to which all those possessed of the requisite education belonged. This was symptomatic of a broad, inclusive view of identity that was not in any way based on skin color. It comes in marked contrast to the efforts of Western scholars to claim the Greek legacy on the basis of whiteness, a principle that they even applied to archaeology, whitening the ancient Greek sculptures that they unearthed by scraping the remnants of their original paint from them. 
It follows axiomatically that the racist discourse subsisting within sections of modern Greek culture has its roots in the Western imposed ontopathology of classical cultural appropriation and the reinvention of a particular conception of Greece in the 19th century rather than being symptomatic of any inherent tradition stemming from ancient or Byzantine times. The Afarinkas of the Middle Terrain who remained during this period were absorbed into the gene mixing pool, which was still carbon organic dominated at this time. Many of the Afarinka Pelasgic and Minoan descendants who had moved further into the Balkan Peninsula as either farmers, herders, mercenaries, or maritime traders mixed with the incoming tribes willingly in most cases such as the Carians, who were a Pelasgic tribe who lived scattered over several parts of Asia Minor and Greece that came from the Aegean Islands. In antiquity, the Carians were famous mercenaries and were mentioned for the first time in the cuneiform texts of the old Assyrian and Hittite empires. Some four centuries later the first to mention the Carians is the legendary Greek poet Homer. In the catalog of ships, he tells that they lived in Miletus. Make note that Miletus is the home of the carbon organic Carians as this is important in overstanding the carbon organic history of Ireland. In the Trojan War, they had, according to the poet, sided with the Trojans. This is a remarkable piece of information, because in Homer's days, Miletus was considered a Greek town. The fact that it is called Carrion indicates that the catalog of ships contains some very old information. The Hellenistic Greeks settled on the coast in the Dark Ages where they and the Carrions mixed. According to the Greek researcher Herodotus of Halicarnassus, the inhabitants of Miletus spoke Greek with a Carrion accent. According to Strabo, Carians, of all the barbarians, had a particular tendency to intermingle with the Greeks. This was particularly the case with the Carians, for, although the other peoples were not yet having very much intercourse with the Greeks nor even trying to live in Hellenic fashion or to learn our language, yet the Carians roamed throughout the whole of Greece serving on expeditions for pay, and when they were driven thence, from the islands, into Asia, even here they were unable to live apart from the Greeks. The mixing of genes in this region continued, creating the carbon organic dominated Mycenaean era on until the Dark Ages after which this new mixed multitude referred to in his story as classical Greece introduces a new lighter mixed stock called the Latins which eventually leads to the downfall of carbon organic dominance in the region. Join us on the next episode as we continue to unravel the mysteries of our past to create a better blueprint for the future for all fallen humanity. This series, The Claim of Thrones, will take you on a journey through the universe, across the galactic heavens to the eventual seating of the planet Earth. This series will also cover the hidden realities of how humanity came about, the various cataclysms and restarts, and follow the various bloodlines of indigenous rites of inheritance. This narrative sets the sacred record straight in regards to who's who on the planet Earth and begins the journey of the lawful reversion and restitution for the heirs of Mother Earth. If you like this content, please subscribe and hit the notification button as well as support across our many social media platforms. Universal peace and blessings to you.